Good morning, I'm Mark Allen with Gaper.io and I'm here today with Josh Frazier, the co-founder of, of Original Protocol. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. How you doing today? Good. And, and full disclosure, we're about 30 minutes from each other. It's a beautiful day here in the Bay Area <laughs> once again. <laughs> so it's, it's nice to have the good weather back. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mark. Yeah, I'm glad you can make it. So can, uh, can you share a brief background of yourself and your work experience? Sure, so I'm Josh Fraser. Um, like I said, I'm co-founder of Origin Protocol, and we're working on building um, blockchain-powered uh, commerce apps. Um, before Origin, uh, founded four venture-backed companies, start, uh, sold two of them, uh, and I've been working in tech um, my, my whole career. Hmm, very interesting. So what is your experience with remote employment, both as an employee and an employer? So I've always been a co-founder. Uh, I've never worked as an, uh, I've never worked for anyone. To be, That's to be great. Um, and before Origin, I'd never worked uh, remotely and actually was pretty opposed to remote work. I hadn't been able to imagine, you know, build, getting stuff built without uh, being able to interact with people in the same office or bounce ideas around. Uh, and with Origin, we started as an open source project. Hmm. And so we, you know, we had this small core team, but we kept finding these random people around the world who just started contributing to our code. And, um, and so we sort of became a remote team just by default because we're like the, the best contributors to our code don't live and don't all live in the United States. Some of them were in New Zealand. Some of them were in India. Some of them were in Estonia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were like, well, we're not going to not hire these people. Uh, and, and so today we're um, very much a, a remote team. Um, we do, uh, as of today, we have an office in San Francisco, um, but more and more we're, you know, a remote team uh, and I've gotten really good at, at working remotely together. Cool. And, and just for, out of curiosity, how many team members do you have? So our core team is 18. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have 18 people. Uh, on the core team, but we have over 150 contributors on the open source side. Wow. Um, so we're very much a, uh, an open source project and, and um, we have people all over the world um, that we're working with and contributing to, to our mission. Wow, and what's been your takeaway from this experience since it's quite unique? Um... I, I think the, the biggest lesson for me is that there's amazing talent everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I think especially people living here in San Francisco, we see, you know, we get a little cocky and think the very best engineers all live here. Uh, and what we found at Origin is like a lot of great engineers uh, live in different places all over the world. Well, actually, that's exactly what Gaper is all about, by the way. We, we hire the top 1% of engineers from all over the world. We, you know, and then they're being in the Bay Area, Berkeley and Stanford and you know, San Jose State, they produce some really good engineers, but there's people like that all over the world. Yeah. So what do you think is the future of remote employment and what do you think could be done differently to make it more effective? Well, so I, I think the coronavirus is forcing uh, this on everyone. Uh, companies that had no intention of ever going remote are suddenly, you know, learning how to use Zoom and, and dealing with it. Um, so I think when when coronavirus is over, a lot of people are going to say, wow, it's actually like we were actually able to be productive. We were able to save uh, a lot of time on commuting to work. We were able to um, save a lot of time. Um, this is wasted when we actually have an office. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's certain skills and muscles that you need to learn uh, to be effective uh, mm -hmm. at working remotely. Um, and a lot of companies are going to come out of this with that newfound skill set mm -hmm. on how to work remotely. And we're going to say, hey, why don't we just continue doing this? Uh, so I, I, I would uh, bet very strongly that um, we're going to see more and more remote work uh, going forward. Yeah, I, I actually think that coming out of this, because um, these things always take time, this has been kind of a shock to the system. But I think it's going to, coming out of this will be the hybrid model before companies embrace the full remote employment model yeah so although some i've talked to some ceos and cios and they're surprised at how how effective it's been <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it's also like it, once you're used to it 
Uh, like it was a very distinct difference between our employees who were used to working remote and our employees who were used to coming into the office, right? Yeah. M- myself being in the, in the latter category and my productivity in the first couple of weeks just plummeted. Uh, right. Whereas the people who were used to working remotely um, were doing just fine, right? Mm-hmm. But then after a while, everyone kind of finds their stride. You start, you know, building new habits of like mm-hmm. okay I, I get up and I uh, go to the other room to work versus mm-hmm. just like you know starting to do email from your bed and you realize it's 2 p.m and you haven't left bed yet <laughs> no yeah it's funny because because I joke with people I work remote for over 10 years and I they say what's your because they in the bay area well what's your commute like I said uh it's about 20 feet <laughs> <laughs> basically to the kitchen table or the the other off I do both I go between my kitchen table and my spare bedroom and you know the coffee, the coffee room is, I can see it right now. It's about 12 feet away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think some of the, some of the things we've learned that like really help one is we have a, we have a policy on cameras on. Um, and, and that makes, that helps people still feel connected and, and feel like they're there. Um, even though, um, you know, you're miles apart. And I think mm-hmm. I, that FaceTime is so important. Um, it really helps if your team is, is strong at written communication. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you, you know, what, what really happens, a lot of those, those conversations move to Slack or Discord or whatever your, um, communication platform is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the, the people will, who do best are people with strong, uh, written skills, yeah. um, because so much, uh, gets moved from that, those face face conversations to, uh, happening in those chat channels. Yeah. And, and that's something people have to work on because um not everything comes through in written as it, as much as it does in written. sarcasm is hard yes <laughs> it, yeah it's yeah, hard yeah, yeah i've had that and and i you know especially if you're busy i don't know you know you get those days where you're busy and someone sends you an email and you just give like a three word answer and they're like oh is something wrong and it's like you know no i'm just busy <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure that's happened to you all the time yeah on both ends too right sure <laughs> So what's the story behind Origin Protocol? Um, what do you guys do? Who's your target audience? Uh, how many customers, stuff like that? Yeah, so we, we started looking at um, companies like Uber and Airbnb and thinking about how um, these companies have, have changed our, our lives, um, but they also take huge percentages of, of fees out of every transaction. And so you take a company like Uber or Airbnb and say, well, why are we paying this company so much? Um, really, fundamentally, what we're paying for is an introduction between uh, buyers and sellers. And thanks to the blockchain, we now have a way for those people to find each other without having to pay uh, for an intermediary. Uh, and so this has a lot of added benefits. You can cut up the fees. And both the buyer and seller get a better price. Um, you... Uh, don't have to worry about it being shut down. Um, we've seen um, a lot of marketplaces be shut down or overly regulated in, in different jurisdictions. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity to reward the early participants in the network um, because you can actually allow those early dry, um, users or providers or buyers um, to have um, some tokens and participate in the, the economics around it. Um, and lastly, it allows us to uh, be instantly global because the blockchain already is global uh, mm. and now you can buy and sell uh, all around the world. And so that's, that's what we, we sort of story. We started with uh, a marketplace app, which was a, a truly peer to peer marketplace where anyone can um, add anything they want to sell and anyone can buy. Uh, and all of this was hosted entirely on the blockchain. Uh, and since then we've been exploring uh, some additional models as well still playing around this concept of blockchain and commerce and giving people new ways um, to buy and sell. Um, So one project we've launched lately is Origin Deals, allows people to save up to 20% on all of our purchases on Amazon. Uh, But by using our token, um, OGN, uh, and you can actually buy our token, lock it up for a certain period of time, which is currently 120 days, uh, and then we'll give you these, these extraordinary discounts uh, on Amazon. So people can check that out at origindeals.com for uh, more details on that. Uh, we also have a new product called DShop, uh, which is 
uh, really a, a fork of our initial marketplace app. Uh, but it's focused on, uh, instead of being many to many, it's just uh, one seller who wants to, to sell a product. Uh, and so it's uh, more of a competitor to uh, Shopify, um, mm. but it's decentralized. So it's uh, completely, again, lives on the blockchain, gives you a lot more freedom. Um, and, and there's some, some really exciting uh, stores we've been launching on that. We, we just launched a stay-at-home shop. So it's stayathomeshop.co. Uh, where we're selling masks. Uh, and so uh, obviously really important for uh, people today, if you want to get some masks, uh, we're selling them at cost. Um, one of the benefits of being a, a global team in remote work, uh, we have lots of friends in China. We have direct relationships with, with uh, some factories in China. Um, and so we're, we're getting the masks, we're selling them at cost. Uh, and then we're actually donating all of our proceeds to CEPI, which is an organization uh, working for a vaccine on, on COVID-19. So anyone who's listening needs some masks, uh, check out the stayathomeshop.co uh, and grab some of those. Wow, that's really great. Um, the, you know, it sounds like your technology can be applied to almost any type of e-commerce. Is that correct? That, that is a goal. Um, part of a challenge is actually how do we focus it, right? We've got mm -hmm. a very general purpose uh, type technology right now. Uh, but it's very hard to build a startup that way. I mean, startups do best when they're focused on uh, specific verticals, specific yes. users in mind. Uh, and so that's what you'll see from us uh, in, in the future is like, how do we actually focus this very broad uh, and wide sweeping technology into much more specific use cases? Yeah, I could see you guys getting pulled in a lot of different directions. I've been there in the startup mode and it's like, it's the hot project of the week. <laughs> <laughs> So, and it is hard to focus, but once you do, it really pays off. And then you can replicate that process over and over again. That's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. So how did you incorporate the idea of remote at your company? Was it forced on you or, I mean, obviously you have the remote. Uh, yeah. So it really, um, it just started from the beginning again, from being open source. Um, we kept having great contributors popping out of all these unexpected places and and jumping in and contributing code and, and our policy was always how do we hire the best contributors right let's just hire the best five percent of people who are mm -hmm. contributing to uh, our open source code base um and you know they, they lived in in different places that weren't san francisco um i think the biggest thing we didn't anticipate i think we talk about remote work for sort of two different types there's remote work that's local Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's remote work that's global. Mm -hmm. uh, and the global um, is exactly the same except for time zones. And that's the biggest challenge, I think, uh, for teams that are shifting to uh, going truly global um, is just dealing with uh, team members on different time zones and, and how you uh, communicate when you know, you're exhausted from a long day at work and, mm -hmm. and Asia is just waking up and, and wants to chat and ask you lots of questions about your feedback. And, um and uh it's it's hard to you know deal with that time zones on a whole whole new yes. level of complexity to uh to remote work that yeah. uh, companies have to figure out how they deal with yeah and, and it's interesting because you're a blockchain based company you almost by definition are global yeah for sure <laughs> yeah i mean it's it just happens <laughs> it, it just happens our, our website's in 20 languages and it was all translated by volunteers like all over the world Oh, wow, that's great. Uh, and, and our when we look at the heat map of like where people are coming from, it, the map's just green. Like it's just mm -hmm. like the entire world is, oh, is um, you know, aware of um, what we're doing. And, and, and it's uh, certainly, you know, 80% of our traffic is outside the, the U.S. Mm -hmm. So um, we've had to embrace the fact we're a global company really from day one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So... With the ongoing pandemic, it's forced many companies to go remote, uh, yours included. Um, were there any roadblocks or challenges that you didn't expect? Not really. I mean, this is largely because we were so remote to yeah. begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a huge advantage where, yeah, there were a handful of employees who weren't used to it, but um, we were used to interacting with all of our remote team members. So nothing really changed as far as our day-to-day -day, uh, practices. Um, mm -hmm. We were already doing tons of video calls, taking copious amounts of meeting notes, um, mm. sharing ideas in, in our Discord channel. So, uh, th yeah, we, we were, were 
quite lucky that it wasn't as nearly as disruptive as it is for I'm sure most companies. A lot of companies that are really disrupted. And, and I mean, maybe I would say, assume just a little bit for your local team that was, was used to coming into the office, but I would assume they've adjusted by now. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I count myself in, self in that group and I'm finding myself being maybe even more productive than I was uh, before. Yes. Well, not dealing with the traffic in the Bay Area alone. <laughs> um, I mean, in my case, it gives me back an, an hour a day easily. Actually, two hours a day is what it if, if I were to have a job in the city, it's, as you know, the traffic, it'll be interesting to see what the traffic's like when this is over. Yes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. So there are companies like Gaper that help build and scale products for startups like yourself. How important do you think that's going to be going forward, um, especially for someone like you that has a global company? Well, I think the, I think a lot of people are going to realize um, if you're going to go remote, which I think uh, first step is everyone's going to go, okay, we're, we're working remote. We'll get used to that. Um, and then they'll say that wasn't so bad. Uh, but as soon as you start doing that, then you start saying there's other opportunities outside of the city I live in because now it's all the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and I'll, I'll give an example of, of how I think this will play out. Um, be, before this all started, I was taking, uh, Chinese lessons here in mm-hmm. San Francisco. Uh, I was paying $75 an hour for an instructor here in San Francisco. We meet and we do it. And as you can imagine, after COVID-19 hit, um, you know, we, we moved to video classes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as soon as we started doing that, I said, should I keep paying $75 an hour in San Francisco? Or should I pay $10 an hour and get someone in China? Mm-hmm. Um, the experience is exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now I've been taking uh, you know, classes for, for $10 an hour instead of 75. I think the exact same thing is going to play out mm-hmm. when people start looking at expanding their workforce. We'll say, now I can ac- get access to a much larger pool of mm-hmm. talent uh, and sometimes at, at cheaper prices. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's interesting. So the question is, now that you're paying less, are you taking more lessons or just paying less? <laughs> I'm actually taking more lessons. Yeah. So I'm doing, yeah, I was doing, I was doing, you know, one class a week and now I'm doing two. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. And you're still paying, you know, less than 33% of what you were paying before. Absolutely. For twice the, twice the value. That's great. Well, well, Josh, <laughs> this has been uh, really interesting and fascinating. Um, I think your company has a great future and I want to thank you for your time today. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Love what you guys are doing. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and have a great day. You too. All right. There it is.